the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. On this feast of all the saints of North America, of course other lands will celebrate their national feasts as well, with the saints of Russia and saints of Marathos, and various you know, national recognitions like that. I don't know if all the countries do, but these are big in those countries. A friend of mine one time was in uh, one of the monasteries in Russia, I believe it was Sretensky, on the Feast of All Saints of Russia, and when the deacon was out in Matins, for the, well, let's say that people, that living which has the multitudes of saints, well, he read all the saints of Russia, and it took him over 45 minutes, and he was blitzing through it. So you can imagine it takes us less than a minute to do that, seconds, really. Um, we have a ways to go. But we have had some bright lights. We should learn from these lights, much as Peter and Andrew did, much as James and John did. In the Psalter it says, O Lord, according to recompense me according to my righteousness and according to the purity of my hands, recompense me. It's not about our vices, because if he recompenses us according to our vices, we have no shot. But he says, according to our righteousness and according to the purity of our hands. So we must have virtues. It's not okay not to just have a negative spirituality, which we don't do something, but we must have a positive spirituality, which we add virtue to virtue and build up and fill up the house with good and righteousness. And we do that by following the will of God, whatever our circumstances are. And we see that, of course, in the Gospel today, when these two men, Andrew had already seen the Christ because he was a follower of John the Baptist, as we know. And he heard John say, Behold the Lamb of God, and went following. But it wasn't quite time yet, so he was back with his brother helping Dad out fishing here. It was a good thing to do, a noble thing to do, helping the family out. But then the Lord comes. Peter was certainly aware as well, because he had heard his brother talking about this. And the Lord comes in this moment in time. <coughs> Excuse me. It is time for their salvation. He says, follow me. And what do they do? They don't hem and haw. They don't wait a few days. They don't debate. They go. They had families. They had lives livelihoods, things to worry about, worldly cares. And we see, of course, over the next three years, they'll be constantly tried in this because they don't believe and they have stresses and they worry and they worry and they worry, but it keeps bringing them deeper and deeper into the faith. A little while later, sanctifying the grounds with his very steps, walking around the seas, he goes and he sees James and John with their father Zebedee. A good Father's Day gift, they were helping their father. But yet, he who loves father or mother or brothers or sisters or mothers or wives or children or lands more than me is not worthy of the kingdom of heaven. And this was their moment in time where he says, James and John, come follow me. And without much ado, they follow. And they go about, and it will change their lives in ways they can't possibly imagine at this point. They can't possibly imagine. They begin to see the healings. They begin to see the kingdom of heaven breaking forth. And that preaching of repentance that their lives must change. From that moment, they had their St. Herman moment. And look at all the saints of North America. And St. Herman tells the people from this day, from this hour, from this minute, let us follow God above all else and seek to follow His holy will. It means the second is the time that the Lord is calling us to repentance. <coughs> and so. <coughs> We have Herman as an example. A monk in Russia, quite comfortable with his life in Russia, had been a novice at Sarov, St. Seraphim as we know now, ended up in Valam with great elders, was quite the ascetic himself. And when the abbot, St. Nazarius, comes and says, Herman, he wants you to go to Alaska. He knew there were Russians there, but he also knew it was a pagan territory. Herman follows, because it was the will for him. A year journey across Alaska. Imagine traveling at that time across Siberia in the time that he did. But then across the ocean. And he set up camp, and he sat there and quietly prayed. And took care of those who came to him. Following the will of God and standing up to those who were showing injustice. And he became a great light. The first example of sanctity in America. And we have others. Peter the Aleut is called 
before these Jesuits to renounce Christ and to cross himself in a non-Orthodox fashion, he refuses to do so and has his digits cut off one by one. He still proclaims Christ. That was his calling at that moment. Come follow me, Peter. Juvenali and his companion are baptizing multitudes, marrying the faithful, and blessing them with the presence of the gospel. The shamans don't like this and brutally murder them. But they see a great light over Juvenali as well. Because Juvenali at that point was told, Come follow me. We know the stories of innocent traveling from island to island on his knees in these little boats, freezing. His wife had perished, of course, when he had gone overseas, and he came back because it was his calling to come follow me. Eventually he was called back to Russia to be a great light there. But he brought the gospel to the people by teaching them worldly things, scientific things, but also teaching them the gospel and translating to their own languages. We have Tikhon who loved Russia very much in his diocese in Russia and mourned leaving Russia. We can see it in his letters. But he also mourned when he was called back to Russia from America. And in both instances, it was come follow me, and he followed, and ultimately followed to his own demise by having to fight off the Soviets constantly. Raphael stood up against sources of this world and goes from town to town to town to try to find Arabs and bring them back to the one true faith, making great efforts. Madarie, one of the new saints who a few weeks ago was brought up from his tomb and was incorrupt. He was younger than I when he died, but he had tuberculosis, but he kept serving regardless. He kept doing no matter what. And they wept, you would hear him in his cell weeping at night because, frankly, the people were hateful to him. And they fought each other all the time, they fought against the gospel. When he was building the church for them with his own hands, they would always want to see the book to see if he was stealing their money. They were hateful. But Madarie kept loving them. And the fruits are still there of Madarie. His prayers are raising up people. Nikolai Vilamirovich suffers in the prisons in Dachau, suffers throughout Serbia, comes to the United States, astounds people in Europe with his speaking abilities. There's one newspaper that said, next to John the Baptist and Jeremiah, this is the greatest man that ever lived, and this was a Jew. It said this. Nikolai Velimirovich knew how to captivate a crowd, but he came here and ministered to people. The people at St. Tikhon's knew him, were astounded by him, because it was, come follow me, and he did. We all know the stories of John of Shanghai and San Francisco. From diocese to diocese to diocese in Europe, in the Philippines, all throughout Europe, to America, guiding his flock, bringing them as a good shepherd, going to Washington himself to <coughs> meet with the president to try to discuss getting these Russians into this country who are being persecuted. And the miracles we know abound because he never gave himself a rest. Those feet never stopped moving. From hospital to hospital, to service to service. And they don't stop now, because he keeps moving for us to this day. Because he followed wherever he was called to go. Alexis Toth brings in over 30,000 people from the Union to Orthodoxy, and suffered greatly for it. Not only from the Latins, but he suffered from his own parishioners who didn't want to learn real Orthodox teaching. I had a priest up north one time told, tell me if they had read his sermons today, he would be preaching the same thing today as he did now because the people still haven't listened. Alas, the churches are dying because of it. But Alexis Toth preached Orthodoxy. It was his call. Come follow me. Jacob of Alaska, up the rivers, baptizing, prismating, marrying to his ultimate demise himself with the health problems and just being worn out. But every day it was come follow me. He didn't worry about his rest in this life. John Kochurov and Alexander Hotovitsky were called to this country, St. John of Chicago, St. Alexander, 
to New York, and they minister to the faithful here, from town to town, ultimately called back to Russia, St. John becoming the first priest martyred in the Russian Revolution, and Alexander at a, at a different date, but later martyred as well. But they came wherever they were called to go. It was, come, follow me. It was not renounce Christ for a minute. St. Sebastian of Jackson, as Nikolai Vilamirovich called a viceless man, the first priest born in the mainland of America, the ordained, the first monk to be born in the mainland of America, a Serb, but born here. And he went too, from town to town to town. His, ser his sermons, if you get a hold of them, are as fresh today as they were then, perhaps even more powerful now. His prayers are helping all of us, but they follow wherever they were called to go. And this is a small list of people. Russia has thousands and thousands, and yes, there have been Orthodox from far longer than we have. But yet, we must follow the example of these men. And certainly there are women that we don't know about yet. We do know about Matushka Olga, who eventually will be glorified. We do know about People in our own midst who we've known who are very, very faithful. And God knows this. There's, oh, believe me, as we preached about last week, I'm sure Father Dimitri must have talked about, there are far more saints that we don't know than we do know. And they may be the greatest saints because they lived in the greatest humility and were least known. They sought to be quiet and humble. And they may have the most powerful prayers in the world. Now we look at these people somehow, I heard the priest, the abbot, say last week, as somehow superhuman. They're somewhere between heaven and earth, between God and man. And that's simply not true. They're who they're supposed to be. We're the ones that are strange. The saints are the ones that are real, because they're following as Adam and Eve were called to follow. They're just being normal, and living the life and opening themselves up to God's presence, no matter what that call might be. And there have been others in this country as well. Father Vasily at St. Tikhon's, Father Seraphim Rose. These people live great lives of Christian struggle in our own midst. We have seen other people. This elder friend is in America because he was called to come here and he followed the will of God. These are difficult decisions when you come from another world completely different. And all these people, with the exception of St. Sebastian, stayed somewhere else, had to go somewhere else. Sebastian did eventually go back to Serbia, late in his life. And then his relics were brought back here. Now, we watch these people in amazement, but what did these people do? They heard the gospel message, and they followed the gospel message. But one thing I discovered more to my amazement over the years of my orthodoxy is people don't know what that is. We do know that Christ became incarnate for us, that second person of the Holy Trinity condescended to come to us. We didn't have to go to him. He came to us to grab us by the hands and say, come follow me. He went into Hades to destroy it. He underwent the death that we couldn't undergo and rose again. The people know these things tangentially because they're not reading the Gospels. I'm astounded when I talk to people, whether it's in confession or outside of it, who don't know the Gospels, have not even read the New Testament. This is simply unacceptable for a literate society, especially people who love God, because this book is about the God that they supposedly love. So you should read it frequently. Every single day you should immerse yourself in it. I challenge everyone in the room who has not done so. The others keep doing what you're doing. I'm going to go ask who, because that's embarrassing. But if you haven't read the entire New Testament, at least you should read the Old as well. But if you've not read the entire New Testament, start today. It doesn't take that long. Do it a few chapters at a time. But don't just read it to say you read it. Read it to see what Christ is telling you each and every one of you, because these words are words of life. Every one of these words is how we are to behave. And then we think about our forebears in this country, the Orthodox forebears, I'm talking about those fathers of the faith, who came into this country with nothing and built churches. 
And sometimes we down here like to deride in all those churches, they don't do things the right way, whatever else. But I was always astounded that these, the place I lived in Pennsylvania, these little coal shacks is basically what they were, with a coal furnace under burning up, you know, it's, I, we never got the thermostat pinned off 80 in the summer, ever. There was no air conditioning. And I remember vividly when they were tearing up the floors of the houses, they had newspapers for their insulation. But guess what? They had a gorgeous church across the street because those people knew what was the most important, the church, the body of Christ, of which he is the head. And we have our beautiful building here, which there are people in this room who will be recognized by God as builders of the church. And may that be to their salvation. But we also have to realize practically that this building will not last in Gwinnett County for decades after decades. It simply can't do it. And if we want the church to grow, if we want to call people to Christ, we have to do what all these fathers did before us. There are countless churches up north with St. Tikon's name as the founder. Which church are we going to found? Is it going to be this one? Or is it going to be gone and someone else after us? Because this is a small building. People won't come after a certain level. We need to be a beacon on a hill for other people to see that. But beyond that, each and, our day, each and every day of our lives, we need to be living the gospel, to be living as these saints that went before us did. They are our examples. They are not exceptions to the rule. They are the rule. And they did as Christ called them at that very moment. When he said, come follow me, they came and followed. What is Christ calling you to do today? <coughs> I'm sure it's not just to keep doing what we've been doing. It's repentance, a life of constant change, a life of constantly moving closer and closer to Him, a life of being fulfilled and filled up with the Holy Spirit, a life that denies ourselves and truly takes up ascetic struggle, because the Christian life is not easy, and this fairy tale land we created in America is not real. No one has ever lived this way. <coughs> Excuse me. And so therefore, what are we going to do? Christ, through his priests, we can turn them into prophets if we allow them not to be worldly people and don't ask them worldly things. And let the Holy Spirit speak to them through Father Peter, through myself, through Father Dimitri. It says, come follow. Christ does use his church to say, come follow. The Gospels to say, come follow. And each and every minute of every day, we should look at what it's saying to us to listen to our conscience, as St. Simeon says, and do what it tells us. That is where we gain. By following Christ's words each and every minute of each and every day, we will be transformed to be the new saints of North America. That they can put on that list. But that's not the ultimate goal. The ultimate goal is just to attain to Christ, which will make us saints. They are synonymous. They do go together. But seek Christ in everything you do, in each and every movement, each and everything of every day, each word you use, each thought that you have, each action that you take, each step that you take, the way you move around the house, the way you think, the way you breathe, the way you eat, the way you do everything, the way you dress. Think of Christ and fill yourselves up with Christ. And be as the saints who were so captivated by that love of God when he came into their midst as we are in this room. They were so captivated that they followed him ultimately to their own death, but ultimately to the kingdom of heaven. All saints in North America pray to God for us. Amen. Amen.